Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Roy Bing Chan, assistant professor of East Asian languages and literatures at the University of Oregon. Chan's research interests include modern Chinese and Russian culture and literature, contemporary Chinese and Russian culture, realism, narrative, and the imperial imagination. He's currently completing a book titled The Edge of Knowing, Dreams, History, and Realism in, my, in Modern Chinese Literature. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So you, this forthcoming book focuses on modern Chinese literature. First question, what led to your interest in modern Chinese literature and culture in particular? Rather serendipitous and circuitous uh, um, move towards Chinese literature. I began interested in French literature, and so I was reading existentialist literature in middle school, uh, reading Camus and Sartre and de Beauvoir, and so I thought that I would be a French major in college. Mm -hmm. um, but I got a four-year ride to University of Washington. I grew up in Seattle, and since my parents weren't paying for my education, and since I wasn't paying for it, I thought, well, why not study something completely different? And so I became a Russian major. I studied Russian language and literature, uh, and I wrote my thesis on modernist Russian literature. And in my last year, I was very mindful of my parents, who were very bemused by the fact that I was doing Russian. <laughs> you know. and, uh, and, and so I, I felt this need that I should probably study the language of my parents, of my heritage. And we had grown up speaking some Cantonese. I, I grew up speaking some Cantonese at home, but, but I never studied the language uh, f formally, either reading or writing, nor had I learned the spoken standard, which is Mandarin. Mm -hmm. So in my last year of college, I took up the study of Mandarin. Uh, then I was accepted as a grad student at the University of California, Berkeley, in comparative literature. And I thought I would focus most of my research on Russian, but as I started to, to work more on my Chinese language skills, I realized that Chinese literature was even more exciting. And so around my third year, I decided to switch my research focus into Chinese literature. And I had no idea whether or not I would ever make a career out of it. Mm -hmm. I really felt like this complete outsider I've been dabbling in all these different languages and literatures, and here I am saying I want to do Chinese. Uh, and I think through a lot of great mentorship and a lot of hard work and also a lot of luck, here I am teaching Chinese literature at the University of Oregon. So the, what led to your scholarly focus in particular on modern Chinese literature as opposed to ancient Chinese literature pre-19th century? Well, I'd always been interested in modern literature and in modern history. In mm -hmm. particular, I was very interested in the history of what would lead to the Cold War, mm -hmm. uh, the Soviet Union, uh, and the history of communism and what went on there. And so I, I had a real interest in, in the modern. You know, how do we get to where we are? Um, how do we get to a point where my parents felt they needed to immigrate to the United States to start a new life. What were the historical circumstances that led to that? Uh, and so this, 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 uh, this gnawing kind of desire to understand the circumstances of really my own childhood mm -hmm. and, and my own life really led me to these global questions of what makes the modern world modern? What makes it unique? What causes these flows of resources, but also people across boundaries, across oceans? I study modern European English and uh, British and American and European literature. Is there anything that's particularly distinctive about modern literature in China? Well, Chinese culture has had a very long literary tradition that dates 3,000, 4,000 years, depending on who you ask, uh, starting on, on turtle shells and, and <laughs> on and so forth. Um, but what makes modern Chinese literature distinctive is the fact that the Chinese, at a moment of world historical crisis are trying to write their way out of this crisis. And they're looking to places like Europe, like Japan, and looking at the things that they did to create a modern culture. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they noticed was the rise of literature as a category uh, that was instrumental to state uh, nation building. And so they decide that we need to create, yes, we have this literature, but we don't have a modern literature. We don't write in a vernacular. Mm -hmm. We don't write in the forms that are globally popular, in particular the novel and forms of fiction. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to create this new form of literature that is based on the Chinese language, but following these models that we're seeing around the world and seem to be, uh, they have this, they kind of reverse cause and effect. They mm -hmm. start to see literature as the cause of national greatness rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's right. So in the late 19th century, you're seeing people saying, if we had a great literature, if we could write like Dickens, then we could be as strong as England. Mm -hmm. And so I think this 
political and historical overdetermination of modern Chinese literature and its attempt to bring in a certain kind of cultural modernity is what makes Chinese modern literature so interesting for me. Mm. You just mentioned um, Dickens. So Dickens is one of the great British mm -hmm. realist writers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the subtitle of your book is um, Dream Dreams, History, and Realism. So let's start with dreams. Mm -hmm. What led you to dreams, the rhetoric, and the representation of dreams in particular? And then the second question is, how does that go with realism? It's a very good question. It's a question that in some ways I'm still trying to answer, even though I'm more or less finished with the book. Um, I've always been interested in dreams, the rhetoric of dreams, the symbolism of dreams, and so on. Um, and one of the things I noticed is that it pops up a lot in modern Chinese literature. And I thought this was very interesting because modern Chinese literature had this social imperative to uncover, to reveal social reality as a way of critiquing it and perhaps utopian in a utopian sense, mm -hmm. transforming it. Mm -hmm. And so why in this literature, in particular in realist literature, with this commitment to social reality, we're seeing so much language about dreams. Mm -hmm. At the same time that realism uh, is, is making waves in the Chinese literary scene in the early 20th century, so is Freudian psychoanalysis mm -hmm. uh, and this idea that we can map out the psyche in a scientific manner. So they're very interested in the human psyche and they're trying to rationalize the mind because they, can, they figure, well, one of the things we're trying to do to create a modern Chinese nation state is to create citizens. And one of the things that all citizens should have in common in a democratic society is the abil ability to be rational. So what's going on in the mind? And so they have this real interest in dreams as a kind of mental phenomenon that can say something about the subject, mm -hmm. about the citizen's mind. And so you have that as well uh, in the way that they're trying to scientize mm -hmm. kind of this, this uh, lore about dreams that they've had for millennia. But this other thing that I'm interested in is you have this very paradoxical situation in China where on the one hand, you have the, the desire to modernize through science, through reason, through critique. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you also have this wild revolutionary utopianism. How do we get to the promised land as soon as possible? Mm -hmm. And for me, what's interesting about the figure of dreams in this literature is that it seems to capture this contradictory impulse in Chinese modernity. On the one hand, using reason to analyze and probe and understand our situation. On the other hand, the desire that's needed to create a revolution, to create a change, to create reform. And so how do you talk about the, this paradoxical pairing of reason and desire, critique and utopia mm -hmm. all at the same time? And the language of dreams, I argue, was a way for them to kind of articulate that dichotomy. In my field, we tend to think of realism as preceding modernism, mm -hmm. and then modernism comes along, and modernism is where people start writing about dreams. Yes. But in your, in your account, mm -hmm. these things are not, they go together. Dreams and realism go together. Right. So what's, what's realism in modern Chinese literature like? It doesn't sound like exactly. realism in European literature to me. And it's funny because I teach in a graduate seminar right now in Republican era literature, and I was discussing this problem of chronology. Mm -hmm. What happens is that uh, in Western literature, and even in Russian literature, mm -hmm. you go from sentimentalism, uh, romanticism, you go to realism, mm -hmm. you go to modernism. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have this linear progression. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen in China. All of these trends are happening at the same, same time. time. And so realism is in play when modernism is also in play. Mm -hmm. And of course, it has effects on each other. Mm -hmm. you, can't point, you can't find a realist work that doesn't have modernist elements, and you can't find a modernist work that doesn't have some realist elements. Uh, and so you have this interesting non-synchronicity or actually a, a complete synchronicity of these, but a kind of combined and uneven development of these literary trends. Uh, and so that makes dealing with literary history and literary categories so much, somewhat slipperier mm -hmm. in the Chinese context because you're not dealing with that gradual linear progression that you have in other places. Hmm. So you're, you're, a, you're a prolific scholarly worker and you have a second book project, mm. and this one is a comparative study of modern Chinese and Russian Soviet literature. And you've, you've given us a, a kind of personal history of how it is that you're an expert in both of these, uh, in both of these national traditions, both of these um, literatures, both of these languages. Um, why, is, why is a comparative study between Chi modern Chinese literature and modern Soviet literature, why is that worthwhile? Why is that an important thing to do? Well, 
on a purely pragmatic sense, it makes use of the languages I know best. Right, I know. And the literatures <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. Um, but 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 that's really the the uh, million dollar question. Uh -huh. Why compare these two? Uh -huh. Right. Uh, they come from completely different cultural heritages. Uh, one of the things that I'm making an argument for is what happens because of the rise of a certain global capitalist modernity that all of a sudden China under the Qing Empire and Russia under a Tsar's empire become geopolitical neighbors. Mm -hmm. They share a border. Mm -hmm. They uh, have to sign a treaty about the border in the late 1600s, a treaty of Nerchinsk. Uh, and because they don't know each other's languages, they have to write the treaty in Latin. Uh, so the Qing court has their Jesuits on the, on, mm. on the job. So, mm -hmm. so this complete uh, incommensurability of these two geopolitical neighbors, and yet history has decided they shall become neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of paradox that I'm working through. In what ways do we have to find commonalities, not because of any kind of natural organic link, but because of an, a certain accident of history itself. And so the book traces this mutual cultural and geopolitical fascination between Russia and China from the late Tsarist Li Qing era all the way, I hope, to the present day. And it reads the shared adventure or misadventure with communism as an attempt to carve out an alternative modernity from the West. And I argue that what they had in common wasn't just communism. Mm -hmm. Communism itself was a symptom of a larger sense of belatedness, a larger sense that they were not in sync with the rest of the world. They were not in sync with Western Europe. Uh, both Russia and the Qing Empire started out as very strong inland empires, and all of a sudden, by the late 18th century and the 19th century, they get lapped up by maritime capitalism coming out of Britain. Uh, and Britain is remaking the world in its own image. Mm -hmm. And Russia and the Qing Empire seem to be left out. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I argue is that uh, uh, this mutual cultural fascination is symptomatic of this meditation on this problem that they're both grappling with, and they're grappling with today. When we look at the politics, when we look at Xi Jinping, sure. Uh, having uh, powwows with Vladimir Putin, we're seeing uh, a yet another manifestation of this problematic. So th the texts that you study in, in, this, in the second project, those are texts in particular that they're Russian texts, they're Soviet texts that are concerned with China, mm -hmm. they're Chinese texts that are concerned. So are yes. there a lot of those texts that are? Th there are actually a lot. Um, and so one of the real problems in putting this book together is find the texts that are most emblematic and that will yield the most insight. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, say in the so socialist period, you know, so many texts from the Soviet Union mention China as mm -hmm. the next place where we're going to have a revolution. Mm -hmm. And so many Chinese texts look at the Soviet Union as this is the promised land, this is what we want to, to be like, or during this, after the Sino Soviet split, this is what we don't want to become, mm -hmm. so on and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, and so I had to be very careful to find texts, find stories um, that were s centered around a certain theme. So not just about r the other country, but around some, some thematic. And so uh, one of the very first chapters I wrote was uh, a Russian story about the Russian Civil War. Uh, and then there is a Chinese partisan who's fighting for the Reds. Hmm. And there the theme is language. What happens, what, how would you create a Soviet international language of socialism uh, by borrowing elements of a Chinese partisan's pigeon patois? Hmm. Fascinating. Right? And so how do you create this kind of ecumenical language of socialism by taking bits and pieces from the Asian other? Um, another text is a novel about a late Qing era diplomat who becomes the ambassador to Russia and is given a set of maps that supposedly show uh, the actual border between the Qing and the Tsar's empire. Since so he's using them in negotiations with the border, uh, they turn out to be forgeries, and mm. as a result, they lose territory uh, to the Russians. And he's disgraced. Hmm. And so in that chapter, I'm looking at this theme of visuality. How is geopolitical visuality constructed under global capitalism? Hmm. What are the ways of seeing that one has to learn to be modern? And why does this Lei Qing diplomat, who is the uh, top candidate of the imperial examinations, why is he unable to see something that's right in front of him? Hmm. Fascinating. So, so that's kind of been the goal, is to, is to not just talk about this geopolitical conflict, but to wrap it around a theme mm 
uh, that this text, I argue, would, would deal with. Are any of these texts, are the Chinese texts translated into Russian or into English? And are the Russian texts tra tra translated into Chinese or English? Um, there is some translation into English, not a lot. This isn't a field that is very popular in, mm -hmm. in English-speaking places. Mm -hmm. um, certain socialist realist texts were translated into Chinese uh, from, the from the Russian, mm -hmm. in particular one, um, How the Steel Was Tempered by mm -hmm. Nikolai Storovsky, mm -hmm. probably the premier socialist realist novel. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. This has probably a much more fabulous career in China than ever did in the Soviet hmm. Union. Interesting. To the extent that even after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the Chinese produced a miniseries based on this novel in Ukra uh, set in Ukraine. Huh. So, so it's interesting how the, the Chinese actually became be bigger fans of some of this Russian literature than the Russians themselves ever did. Have you taught here a, com a comparative course in r Russian and Chinese lit? Not rec not yet. Um, Is it possible? I mean, in I terms of the I linguistic demands. I think I think to design such a course, we'll have to find a way to work through the issue of translations yeah. because um, there isn't anyone. Uh, I don't. I'm probably the only person that I know of who can speak both languages and mm -hmm. read both languages. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that such a, s a seminar would be accessible to students. Um, but there has been discussion about perhaps offering that kind of course. Um, I'd also love to just offer a general comparative course mm -hmm. on Russian and Chinese literatures in translation. In translation. Uh, um, are there enough texts that you could do that with? I suppose there must be enough texts that you could do that with that well are translated into English from yes, both languages. Yes, well you could either do a, a course where the Russian texts and the Chinese texts are actually addressing the other, or we could do a more general kind mm -hmm. of comparative course. So when I was a postdoctoral fellow in Harvard, I actually taught a course that compared Russian realism and Chinese realism in translation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You also have a third book project, or a, a third An scholarly idea. project. Mm -hmm. um, that one's on modes of care mm -hmm. in socialist regi regimes mm -hmm. in China and, and Russia. How'd you come to that topic? Um, one of the things that I noticed when I first became a professor, and so I spent four years in the College of William and Mary, was the emotional and mental health needs of our students, uh, and how we as academics are simply not trained to deal with college-age students, adults, who are dealing with major distress. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by the bureaucracy involved uh, uh, and how institutions like universities manage, uh, biopolitically manage their populations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was really interested to think about well, this category of care mm -hmm. and how we would think about it. Um, and not just in America, but I was interested, in, well, what was going on in Russia and China? Did they think about care, this kind of pastoral care of someone who is suffering? Mm -hmm. Uh, during the socialist eras, they didn't have psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. Freud was banned. He was mm -hmm. considered a bourgeois or um, an, an imperialist. Mm -hmm. uh, but that didn't mean that they didn't have the disciplines of psychology. And that didn't mean that other fields didn't deal with the issues of emotional care. And so what I want to do with this third project is to look at the socialist period in both of these countries and see how they articulated this category, because I think that they did, because when you read socialist realist novels, when you have the very familiar plot point where a communist converts mm -hmm. uh, someone into the creed uh, and, and, and converts them into Bolshevism, mm -hmm. the conversations that they have are almost like conversion conversations. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. not really about politics. Mm -hmm. They're about their personal lives. It's about their emotions. It's about trauma. And so the hunch that I'm having is that political ideology um, and, and the category of politics itself actually did a lot of this emotion work. Whereas in the West, it was through private uh, psychotherapy and private psychology. Mm -hmm. um, but in these regimes, um, this was very public. Um, and so that's what I want to probe, is, is how do they talk about this issue and how do they represent it in cultural texts? Mm -hmm. Fascinating. You just mentioned that you uh, taught, that you started your career at the College of William and Mary. You arrived at the U of O in 2013. Um, you went from a liberal arts college to a state university. Mm -hmm. Why, wh what was appealing about the University of Oregon for you? Well, uh, several reasons. I grew up in Seattle, and I had this 
this, this huge desire to come back to Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, I went to the University of Washington. I was a scholarship boy, mm -hmm. um, got a full ride. Um, and of course, state universities are big monsters where you're kind of invisible. Um, but for me, it was such a great opportunity to learn the things that I could never have learned in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, neither my parents uh, finished high school or went to college. We were the first generation to go to university. And even though my mom never went to college, one of the things she always uh, instilled in us was the value of education and, 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 and the privilege it is to, to be able to, to take classes in these different disciplines. And so, you know, I didn't get a lot of hand-holding at the University of Washington, but I was such a precocious person that I just went ahead and took the classes I wanted. Um, and so, coming to the University of Oregon, I've been very clear about the fact that just because you can't afford to go to a liberal arts college doesn't mean you can't have a high-quality education in mm -hmm. a state school. And I think the state has a commitment to offering this kind of humanistic uh, tr uh, education to students who otherwise couldn't afford it, someone like me. Uh, and that's a real commitment that I have. You know, when I teach a big course of 100 students, sure, there's going to be 30 or 40 who are just there and aren't really paying attention. But there are all those other students who want to be there and who are often surprised that, that actually a big class, there can be a moment of learning, there can be a moment of insight. Um, and so I remind myself that's why I'm doing it, and that's one of the big reasons why I came here was uh, I got that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I was able to take those classes. I couldn't afford to go to a nice liberal arts college or to an Ivy League. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why a student in the state of Oregon couldn't do the same. You, you've just given a very eloquent uh, argument in favor of uh, public undergraduate mm -hmm. education. But also at a research university like the University sure. of Oregon, you, you as, uh, as professors, we also work with graduate students. And I know that you've taught a number of graduate seminars since you've been here. That's not an opportunity that comes for a professor at a liberal arts college generally. Right, speaking. right. So what's that part of your teaching been like? That's been a really amazing part of the experience so far is that is I've been able to teach four or five graduate seminars already and, and to have a cohort of graduate students. Um, so, uh, and it's a very different kind of teaching. It's just really training in the field. Um, but even better is the opportunity once a week to sit down with a group of motivated students and talk about a text for three hours. Um, there are moments when we are just talking about text and, and, and uh, you know, trading zingers and back and forth uh, that it just feels like, you know, what other moment in your life can you do something like that? Yes. That you can talk about a text <laughs> and live in that world and, and have that thing. And whether or not my students end up becoming teachers or academics or doing something else, um, it's time well worth spent. You mentioned that when you were at William & Mary, you became aware of and became concerned about the mental health of undergraduates. And I know this is a concern that you've brought with you here. Mm -hmm. um, to talk a little bit more about that concern and about your understanding of um, the role that professors sh uh, should ideally have in this right, kind of right. confronting this challenge. As you say, we're not trained. We're not trained, no. So how should we, I mean, this is clearly and probably a growing problem mm -hmm. for our students. Mm -hmm. How should we, as professors, as the professoriate, how should we um, respond to this uh, challenge? Um, I'm not sure if I have clear answers. I know my very first year I was co uh, college with Mary, I was called in by the counseling office to see if I could help a graduate student from China who had attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. And they thought that having a Chinese speaker like me might help. And that's when my eyes were open. Uh, and I felt very helpless. I, I didn't really feel like that speaking Chinese was going to do much for the student uh, and really thought about that. And then after that, I've had many students come to me with, with, with um, emotional issues, uh, with their sense of distress, and puts you in a weird situation, right? Because uh, we're not counselors, and the best you can, and what you try to do is you try to direct them to those resources. And so part of it is educating ourselves as faculty what those resources are and how to get in touch with them. Um, but beyond that, you know, for many of our students, when they're going through emotional distress, they're maybe not going to tell their family mm -hmm. because they don't want to distress their family. They're mm -hmm. maybe not going to talk to their friends because they don't want to freak their friends out. Mm -hmm. Very often, the faculty is the first line. And I think we need to be sensitive to, to that, that very often they come to us because they're not sure who else to come to. And 
for me, I think it's very important to be open to that and to listen to them. Of course, then you direct them to the proper resources, um, but to be there for them. And I think this is part of what it means not just to be a professor, but to be a teacher, mm -hmm. that we're trying to help them grow, not just intellectually, um, but to mature as emotionally sensitive adults. Not all professors are equipped to do that. You and I know this. <laughs> um, and so I wouldn't say that every professor has to do this, mm -hmm. but I think it makes a huge difference. And I've seen the difference it can make uh, when you do intervene and when you do say, I care and I'm concerned and I hope you could maybe tell me about what's something that's going on. Um, and I think this is why it's so important that we don't treat faculty and the staff simply as commodities. That we're doing much more than that. You know, we're not just teaching content. We are helping, I always say that what we're doing is we're giving witness to these students as they become adults. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is a sacred uh, mission that we have. Uh, another wonderfully eloquent statement, thank you. We have uh, just a couple of minutes left. This is probably the last question. You've already given us a sense of yourself mm -hmm. and the fullness, but um, I'm uh, given especially what you've most recently been talking about, are there other interests and concerns, um, aside from your research, as a citizen, as a human being that you, <laughs> that you're, that you pursue uh, in, in living this life as a scholar and a teacher and an academic? Uh, that's an that's, uh, interesting question. You know, I, I, I look young, but you know, this <laughs> the struggle to get this book published has caused me to go in and out of all kinds of cycles of <laughs> despair, and, and it, it really forced me to think about why am I doing this? Why am I trying to publish this book? Mm -hmm. Is it because I want tenure? And which is obvious, you know, the obvious reason, right? You, know, you need to publish a book for tenure. But I realized that that was the wrong motivation in the end, and that I had to make this book about what I loved and what I loved were these texts. Um, and so, as a scholar of literature, you know, I dabble in theory, I dabble in gender sexuality, I dabble in all kinds of things. But ultimately, it's about learning to read and talk about texts. There's, there's a wisdom and there's a knowledge in being able to do this and to do this well that serves us not just as readers of literature, but also as human beings. Well, that is a perfect place for me to stop this okay. interview. I'm out of time. Just what I wanted, was <laughs> hoping you would say, thank you so much, Roy, for talking to us today. Thank you, Paul. It's been a pleasure. I've been speaking with Roy Chen, Assistant Professor of East Asian Languages and Literatures at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching.